Welcome to our continuing 2018 educational webinar series. I am Katherine Short, Partnership Marketing Specialist for First Healthcare Compliance. At First Healthcare Compliance, we help you with a comprehensive compliance management solution tailored to your business, a hospital, hospital network, healthcare practice of any size, billing company, or skilled nursing facility. As part of our complimentary educational webinar series, we bring you experts from around the country to discuss relevant topics in the healthcare industry. We are so pleased to have Karna Morrow, Director of Consulting at Coding Strategies, CPC, RCC, CCSP, Ahima approved ICD-10 CM trainer. Karna possesses over 15 years of experience within community and academic hospitals, as well as private practices and third-party billing companies in areas of billing and collections to coding and compliance, revenue enhancement, and process improvement. Karna possesses and provides coding strategies clients with coding support, audits, and customized on-site training. Her areas of specialty include diagnostic radiology, interventional radiology, cardiology, and evaluation and management. Karna holds a Bachelor of Science from Weaver State University. A copy of the slide deck is available for download on the control panel. Feel free to submit questions into the question box on your control panel during the presentation. We will address questions at the conclusion of the presentation. Your PACOM CEU certificate will be emailed to you from PACOM following the broadcast. There is no need to request it. Additional CEU opportunities will be available to BC Advantage members following the live broadcast. See their website for details. Karna, go ahead. Coding Strategies is pleased to continue our association with FIRST Healthcare and bring coding and compliance tips. And we hope that this specific session, there was an audit, now what? will provide a solid return on the investment of the time that you'll spend with us today. We appreciate your respect to the copyrights. The content cannot be recorded or reproduced outside the permission that has been granted to First Healthcare. While the actual codes and descriptions will be limited in this session, it is important for us to recognize that all codes and all descriptions are a copyright of the AMA. We have at least 10 things to do each day in our position that never seem to get done. Those tasks that carry over from one to-do list to the next until maybe they just won't be needed anymore. Auditing may be one of those tasks for you. <laughs> Auditing is time consuming. It's a challenge when you have an external review and the outcomes seem to highlight only the exact same things you have attempted to resolve for months. Okay, years. Is it better to have an audit and do nothing or avoid the whole auditing process and beg forgiveness? We know that auditing is a key component to our compliance plans. We need them. But I'm gonna challenge that we can make the task one of the most resourceful and beneficial to our practice. To get to that end point, I have four primary objectives for the time we can spend together today. First, I believe that the most important objective or the most important obstacle to overcome is to have an audit to have a review that we can actually incorporate into our daily process. In the trenches, do something with those results. We need to be able to translate an error rate into actual training. And I need to know when error rates are just good education and when I need to really raise a red flag. I need to drop my own fears about external reviews and recognize that they actually can be pretty critical to the sanity, if not just the health of the practice. So first and foremost, I challenge you to change the paradigm. Words carry enormous weight. The word audit is akin to a student walking into a classroom and seeing the word test on the blackboard. Within the industry, the results have been seen much like test results. Participants feel the full weight of passing or failing. 
What can be leveraged into training opportunities and strengthened workflow has become a long exhausted debate over what should or shouldn't have been diagnosis number 15 on a claim form. We're so focused on the outcome. We're so focused. Did I pass? Did I fail? Am I at 95%? We sort of miss the point. How we approach the task is really the key to the outcome. If I can take a minute and just sort of illustrate my comment. You have audit results on your screen. What do you notice first? I'm willing to bet our eyes as adults and as management honed in on the bottom line. We honed in on how well did we do? What was your first response? Wow, that's horrible. Any thoughts about who may be involved in those coding tasks? Have you already decided if it was the coder or the physician or that billing company who owns the errors and they'd better answer for their crimes? Did you take the high road and start to wonder what was behind the numbers? Did you start to ask the more functional questions? Huh, I wonder which procedures. I wonder if there are any trends within those errors. Did all of the CPT codes, all 31 of them, happen to be the same code, that same new procedure that we've been struggling with? Did the diagnosis codes, did those errors reflect disconnects in the primary code? Or was the auditor holding the team to an overly conservative standard and going clear down to the fourth or the fifth? The approach, that first response, is a huge indicator to how this task is performed within your practice and maybe the first place to improve. Let me look at this another way. We all know about the infamous bell curve. It's been around since the beginning of coding. Physicians and even coders shy away from a certain level of service because we don't want to stand out. We don't want to be that outlier. Does that sound familiar? Have you already planned your one on one meeting with whichever physician is that black line and happens to represent the physician billing all of the 99215s? I presented this topic in a public conference and I had an attendee ask a question. What do we do when our physicians bill those 99215s that we know were not justified? I asked which part of the E&M was most frequently short in the documentation requirements for 99215. And the attendee boldly stated, we don't look at any records, but it's unreasonable for physicians to build that many 99215s. Well, everyone in the room was a little shocked that someone would make that response. But didn't we just draw the same conclusion about 99215? and the physician with the black bar. There's a lot more behind the numbers. There's a lot more than just that final outcome. If the audit results were only in statistics, then we'll never meet the learning objectives. Results are rarely what they seem to be, and they say nothing about how the codes got onto that claim form. Before we assume that the coders are clueless or the physicians are on a quest for higher RVUs, let's make sure that we really know if it's an apple or an orange. Let's make sure we have all of the information. The audit results are our first attempt at data mining, but we can't stop there. Before I get too far, let me make sure that we're also auditing the whole picture. For those of you with hospital-based procedures, be sure that your auditing includes a comparison of the facility charges against the professional charges. You may have placed yourself on the payer's audit radar simply because the professional claim listed the procedure, let's say, as a biopsy, and the facility's claim reported as a aspiration. Maybe that's not the best example, but aspiration and drainage can definitely cause some disconnects. Depending on the type of your practice and the scope of your services, the type of the audit you're going to perform is going to vary. Is, I understand it is going to vary greatly, but it really highlights the worst myth of an audit. If our audits are focused on just the fact that, wow, 
I had a 95% accuracy. My practice is doing great. We have nothing to worry about. Mm, I know how that works for you. The result can only reflect what was reviewed and may or may not highlight the real challenges. You know, as a company, Coding Strategies provides quarterly audits for many of our clients. One quarter, however, the review for a specific client seemed very heavily weighted towards services that would not normally be on my radar. For example, it was a radiology review with a high percentage of one view chest x-rays. Okay. In a casual conversation, I learned that the coders were under some tight scrutiny and there was an upcoming board meeting. So a 95% external wood review would, in the client's words, go a long way to build the confidence of the board. Okay, I'm not sure that the time, the resources, and the eventual confidence makes even one step towards our true primary objectives in making the audit more than just an event. Okay, don't let me sidetrack too far. Back to evaluating our revenue cycle. Think about your own workflow. At what point are the charges captured and by whom and with what documents? We don't all live or work in the same type of environment. Sometimes the ICD-10 and the CPT codes are on the claim form and out the door before things are even really documented. If you're in a hospital environment, you know what I mean. Charges are dropped by the technologist, they're dropped by the OR staff based on your charge master and they've never seen the final documented report. Others, we may actually have the documentation and then choose the CPT and ICD-10 codes, claim goes out the door, but where is the reconciliation from a third party? Some EMRs require the provider to select the codes before closing out a progress note. Okay, if it's 9.30, I've been here since six, I'm ready to just pick a code and move on and sometimes that can happen i really want you to look at any discrepancies in coding it's as much a system issue or a workflow issue as it is a pay, as, as it is a person issue if if that makes sense okay the foundation of any good audit can answer the very blunt question what's the point Okay, I've got six common responses here. If I asked you why you completed the last review, was it just part of a compliance plan? Did you have a physician who was curious why his RVUs dropped? Or do you have a new physician? Let's see, it is February. That means new codes went into effect less than two months ago. So I'm auditing to see the new CPT codes. Are you auditing because it's part of your employee's performance reviews? Have you started to see an increase in denials from the payer? Or did it just so happen that the practice across town recently became headline worthy in a DOJ investigation? And you wanna make sure that you're not up against the same scrutiny. The takeaway here is if you have a specific agenda I want to know X. I want to see how the new templates are being implemented. I want to see if the automation of our attestation statements is working. The more you evaluate the process on a, real on a routine, real-time basis, the closer we get to our stated objectives. <laughs> if you've ever worked in a hospital environment, then you can share with me the fear that is invoked by that internal code word coming across the PA system that everyone knew Mickey Mouse is not in the building, Jayco is on site. That once in a cycle, that event that puts all employees on their toes, the manuals are dusted off, the answers are rehearsed for the one week that they're on site. What happens the next week? Exactly. That is not incorporating the intent of an audit into our daily world. Think about these targeted scenarios in which you may want to review the process. We do get new providers, new coders, and new code sets. And we've all been in the situation where a provider has told us, but where I worked before, I could do. 
but we got paid for. We've all heard that. And that's a good opportunity to sort of check and follow up and evaluate. There may be changes in the EMR. There may be um, a new billing system, a new module, um, as we think about all the quality measures that are coming up. And we think about how the systems are going to implement um, the appropriate use criteria. And how are we going to make sure that that new authorization code for all advanced imaging actually makes it on the radiology claim of which I have no control? Any of those targeted review processes provide a great opportunity. But does each targeted review, each objective, each question, does it require the same process? Do we pull 10 charts per and painstakingly review the medical record in each and every one of them? Are you sure you need to do that? Is it possible to data mine by CPT or even ICD-10 and compare the trends when new codes are put into place? Is it possible to trend one provider against another within the group for a specific code or code range? Does one utilize a higher level? Um, let's say they might use more of the complete versus the limited. They might build more complex um, repairs than limiteds. What, <clears throat> excuse me, whatever's appropriate for your code set. Before we go printing uh, medical records and killing trees, leverage your system for at least step one and step two, evaluating the process. Save that dig into the medical record for step three, when you have reason to believe that that additional step is even necessary. Many external reviews or even internal reviews are mirrored after physician documentation. In other words, I know what the end result is but not the thought process it took to get to that conclusion. It's the process, that thought process where the improvement lives. So instead of just knowing, do I agree or disagree? Show the provider how you got there. Identify opportunities, literally what line, what word phrase, what can they do <clears throat> to improve their note? Do not tell them that they need better medical decision making. Not helpful. Show me within the note how I can clarify if this cardiac condition is or is not being managed or what cardiac condition is or is not being managed. Drill down to that level. When we dive into the records, it is insufficient to just simply realize that the correct code was assigned. Sigh relief and move on. Internally, we need to be aware and respond to cloning or the perception of cloning before any external review finds it. It's interesting as I review charts that I see what I call our magic phrases. These are lines that have been lifted directly out of the CPT guidelines and they are clear prompts from the coding team that this must be documented in order to code that. Are we sure this even happened? So in a radiology review, reviewing a lot of pick, li pick lines, in every single chart there was the magic phrase and permanent images were stored. Really? This office doesn't have the equipment to store images coming from an ultrasound. As I queried the physician, he was very calm and he simply said yes. Our coders told us we had to document that before we could bill 76937. Okay, that's true, but you have to do it before you can bill it. And so there's phrases like that that we have to be very careful about. Now this cardiologist that increased his Medicare reimbursement by 22,000 by inflating or puffing up what the patient's di diagnosis was may or may not have been doing it intentionally but it happens we get told that this code that this diagnosis isn't covered you must use one of these well we need to go back to training the physicians to document what was known document the decision points document the sequence of events and then apply um, coding and reimbursement guidelines on top of that. 
E&M, I know, are very subjective in nature, and they're extremely frustrating to the physicians. It takes longer to document an office visit than it did to conduct the visit. There's just, as coders, I think we put too much emphasis on the bullets. And you have three of these and six of these, and don't forget to say this. Let's just focus on the basics. When I work with coders to improve their outcomes or to incorporate findings into their world, one of the things that I've learned is it's insufficient to say, I agree with the code you've assigned. We need to know how they came up with that code. I can guess my way to accurate coding in some situations. It doesn't help me when the next provider doesn't dictate in the same manner. And think about what I just said. When you audit, when you review, have you ever drilled down to see if, you know, Dr. X's reports can be coded without errors, but Dr. Y's always seem to have the errors? Is it the person, the process, the coder, the provider? I hope you're starting to get a feel for the reality that this task we call auditing may in some ways be what we do every day, we just don't document the results in a way and the effort in a way that our compliance team will say, yep, that's an audit. At the same time, what we are doing and calling an audit may not be worth the time it took. Okay, come back to my example. Sorry for these bunny trails. If a coder can highlight the phrase that they would use to support their code choice, I can see gaps in learning. I can see opportunities for more clarity from the providers to make the document more external auditor proof. No, I, I don't want to be dictating for reimbursement. But if adding the phrase point to point in front of the 3D mapping for cardiac ablation will save me from a peer to peer review, well, the ROI on those three words just went up. Each person participating day, today has a really different agenda for evaluating your coding process. But again, don't get caught up in what brings great results, as I've previously shared. Don't get caught up in what is comfortable, that we always do 10 charts per quarter per coder. Okay, but which charts? I appreciate the concept of random, but why not randomly select from a target selection that matches what the payers are auditing. Don't spend 40 hours auditing something and neglect what is on the OIG work list for your specialty. If two practices in town have made the headlines for insufficient supervision of your office procedures, well, then auditing that documentation is going to be more relevant than if you build consults versus new patients. How do you know what the payer is watching? Watch the headlines, the DOJ alerts for medical practices. Have you read the OIG work plan for 2018? What topics not only are in the work plan, but what topics have been in the work plan for more than one year? Watch the topics in the CPT assistant month over month. When there are no less than 10 articles, about my ultrasound guidance, I can safely draw the conclusion that they feel we're not documenting those as they're being performed or we're billing them without the appropriate documentation. What information are you personally getting from your payers? Talk to the back end. Is there a spike in those um, additional documentation requests? What are the payers um, sort of suspending until they get additional medical records? These are all of the red flags and they should dictate what you're data mining. They should dictate what you're auditing. And then it's part of your process, not simply because I do 10 charts per physician per quarter. Okay, we've used this term data mine a couple of times and I, I guess, let me clarify, I mean it in two ways. One, as I just said, manage the type of data that you're reviewing by leveraging IT, but also data mine to reduce the number of records that are actually pulled for review. And if you look at the information here on this slide, maybe you'll get a better understanding of what I mean. 
I had a client that asked me to participate in um, a payer review. The payer was requesting a payback and they asked if I would review the records. More than happy to do that. But then they wanted me to use the results of that audit to do physician training. No. <laughs> Payers are doing retrospective, and in this case, the dates of service were almost four years. You do not train a physician today on documentation from four years ago. You've really got to match um, what do I want to say? The systems. Uh, not only was that just a, um, a time span issue, but when did you change um, EMRs? When did you change clearinghouses? When did you change billing systems? If the physicians changed templates in January, please don't audit December dates of service. It is counterproductive and does very little to build the rapport and the relationship. If I sit down with physicians to talk about charts and they look at them and go, yeah, we don't do that anymore. Yeah, that was on our old system. It's a waste of time on both sides. So carefully manage that service date range. Run the numbers based on the objectives, whether it is the areas of compliance risk, whether it is the number of um, level five services with a um, diagnosis that starts with R, because we know those are the signs and symptoms. And we know that a simple um, you know, shortness of breath may not automatically warrant a five. I may want to pull it and see that there was data, um, you know, additional data, that there was stuff ordered, we all know the drill, but a stub toe is not going to pay a five. And so if I learn my diagnosis codes, I can data mine before I ever pull the medical record. While I say that, we always want to remember the old adage, don't bite off more than you can chew. Whatever I find, I am going to have an obligation to do something about. And so I've got to be able to consider how long it's going to take to put an action plan in place. You know, even if you want to audit 1% of your business, if 1% of your business is, you know, 2,000 records, okay, one, it's going to take you a couple months to get through that. It's going to take you a couple more months to vet the results. By the time you get down to training on it, the code sets have changed. Auditing every single month is not, may not be the best use of your resources. Audit, and then my personal recommendation is to wait 90 days. We're all really good for that first, you know, month, and then it's really easy to fall back into old habits. So I don't want to train today and audit next week. Odds are there's going to be improvement. But when I know that there's true improvement is 90 days from now, it is still in effect. So what this might look like in the real world where most of us live is like I was just saying, level fours and fives with a single diagnosis. Understanding that I have to meet you know, on a level four, those multiple chronic conditions for an established patient. Or level five, I'm looking at that high level of, you know, risk, mortality, severe exacerbation. But the flip side of that is a level two with multiple diagnosis codes. Level two is straightforward. I want to look at the number of whatever that's happening in a certain week. Um, if I expect in my practice that we do a lot of um, biopsies and we will frequently do multiple biopsies in the same session, then I want to make sure that those add-on codes make sense when I run a frequency report. If we almost never do multiple biopsies, then I should not see add-on codes. Know your providers, know how they practice. Um, whether it's additional vessels, whether it's, you know, if we always do the 10022, which is the fine needle aspiration with imaging guidance. Okay. Well, if I have 500 of those and I know that that CPT code requires the guidance to be reported separately, 
then I'm going to come over here to my 76942 and make sure that there is a reasonable comparison. It may not be one-to-one, -one, but if I only see two guidance codes for a procedure that I know requires it by definition, then that's what I drill down to farther. But I don't pull records until I have that suspicion. I've got add-on codes without base codes or just any type of, yeah, that just doesn't make sense. You know as a practice about how many preventive services that you schedule within a given day. Okay, so if you know you're scheduling for a day, why at the end of a given month do you have 300 built? being mis misclassified as office visits or office visits as preventive. I think you understand where I'm going. You know your practice. The first step of an audit is not to pull records. The first step of an audit is to data mine and determine where those records may, emphasis on may, need to be pulled. And if I don't pull 10 records for this specific provider or that specific procedure, but I have a reason and an explanation and a comfort level, then is that not still evaluating the process? Again, it's the paradigm of how we look at this word. I realize that eventually we are gonna have to pull records and we're gonna have to dive deeper, but look at the process, not the results. As you pull examples, look for the trends. Does it happen to be the same facility? It's interesting at site one, Let's say that the review of systems in the past family social history is always documented. But at site two, it's never captured. But it's the same physician. Think about the workflow. Think about the support staff. If you're curious about a specific coder, then have the same records blindly coded by someone else first. It may not be the coder, but it may be a common interpretation of the record. Let me give you an example. Recently, I, doc I uh, audited a record, and the reason for the visit said neck pain, comma, stabbing. S-T-A-B-B-I-N-G, stabbing. Neck pain, stabbing. What does the word stabbing mean to you? If you code e &M all day, your knee-jerk reaction is going to be that the stabbing is a quality of the pain. It's going to count as one of the data elements for the HPI, so I now have two, location and quality. Well, what if I told you the rest of the story, and I said that this was an ED record from an inner-city facility on a Saturday night? Does that change your interpretation of the word? Yeah, of course it does. Now it's not a data element. Well, it's the context of that neck pain, not the quality of the neck pain. Recognize that language is not as black and light, white as we'd like it to be. Coders are human and will interpret the language. If you're using a natural language coding system, it's not capable of those human translations. And so there's pros and cons to both sides. But one of the fastest ways to identify coding discrepancies, if you have the capacity, is to simply take a percentage of your charts and put them back through the word queue blind. When I was a manager of coders, and it was a true coding department, I did not have the facilities. I didn't have the resources to audit even 10 charts per coder per quarter. So I had the system do it for me. It randomly picked 10 charts, it actually did 10 charts per day, and put them back into the workflow. And they were coded by someone else on the team, blind. No one knew when they had a duplicate. The next morning when I came into work, the system had analyzed things at night, and I had a discrepancy report on my desk. Any time the two coders did not agree, then it would show me what coder one and what coder two had coded. And I could very quickly look at it and go, yeah, that's really a sequencing error, you know, sequencing issue. That's not an error. And I would not look any further. 
or I may look at the two of them, pull up the report. Okay, this person is used to coding in an academic environment. The rules for shared visit are not exactly as they are for residents. And I get it, and it became a training issue. But I allowed the system to do the lion's share of the work for me. One important consideration is to accept that no one will have perfect results. Did you hear me? No one. When an audit comes back 100% accuracy, I actually question the validity of the sampling more than how to praise the participants. Any auditor will find something to improve upon. Do you have credentials included with all electronic attestations, separate and distinct notes for all shared visits? Your reaction to this will highlight your objective of an audit. Are you reviewing to improve the process? Or are you trying to demonstrate a score that you believe implies success? And I don't mean to be harsh, but this task is the lifeline of a compliant practice. If we shortcut the intent or we bypass it being a day-to-day -day application, then we're going to look behind the mark and miss the target altogether. Okay, let's peel this back one more layer. And before you accept those published findings, hopefully before you even started the review, did you define what an error is? I know that that may seem odd, but not everything's black and white. Is it an error when a condition documented in the impression is not included on the claim form? Is it an error only when it was the primary reason for the encounter? Is it an error when the ICD-10 set instructs one to use an additional code? but they didn't, and it was documented. Is it an error if the modifier LT or RT was used when it wasn't required? <laughs> I, had, I had the LT modifier added to an abdominal ultrasound last week. Okay, clearly wrong, but is it an error? It isn't likely the payer took that into consideration when processing the claim. But what about modifier 59? If it's used and there is no CCI added against the two codes, is that an error? Being on the same page as the auditing team at the beginning impacts the application of the results. Do you want to focus on all the errors or just ones that are more than one up, one down in an E&M review? What is the compliance scale? Where's your comfort zone within your organization between that level of a high risk, medium risk, how conservative this is an organizational decision that you really need to think about. The way in which we receive the results is also a big step or an obstacle to the value of the task. Just data isn't very helpful. We've looked at understanding more than just do I agree or disagree, and I am trusting that we have all at least data driven down by provider. And yes, again, there is that knee jerk reaction. Don't focus on the person. Do not suddenly get upset with, you know, um, provider number three or provider number four. Look at the process and make it about that process. I realize that physicians, they can be one and the same, the person and the process. One physician will not use an EMR and refuses to employ a scribe, but don't overlook the fact that there can be work, workflow issues as well. Drive the results down more than just that. Using E and M just as an example, because most of us on the session today at least have that within our service line. So understand that the documentation requirements are different for a new versus an established patient. Well, then I need that I need the data driven down to that level. In other settings, you may need it driven down by what procedures were done inpatient versus outpatient, office versus facility. Some physicians try to beat the system by flying under the radar, as I've mentioned. But to a payer, undercoding is an error just as overcoding. And I would argue why leave revenue on the table. But I need the data to answer the questions. And in some cases, I need the data to change behavior. When we talk about that for E&M, there's even more layers to uncover. 
it's not just a overcoat undercoat or one level, but specifically what am I missing? If the code that was built, let's just focus on that level four, is a moderate level of medical decision making, then that makes sense because that's appropriate. When it gets audited at a lower level, then it's a detail within the template. If it's a new patient, I'm going to be looking for things like that complete past family social. I'm going to be looking for the fourth data element in the HPI. But the physician is choosing the level of service based on their medical decision making, and that's appropriate. So before I go harass the physician that he's coding incorrectly, I want to sit down and identify the disconnect in that documentation pattern. Does that make sense? A frequent challenge is knowing what to do with the, what to do when the results, let's pick on provider four, don't really appear to change month over month. Compliance must be organizationally supported. Leadership must be willing to address the tough questions. It doesn't do any good and can actually harm the practice in the event of a true external review to have documented discrepancies that have not been addressed. Now, don't hear me say that we avoid auditing provider number four because that's going to come out as well. But if you're committed to compliance, that means being committed all the way through even the hard stuff. What was it that grandma used to say? You can catch more flies with honey than vinegar. We have a lot of work to do in this area. We've set up our little silos and it's sort of had an us versus them mentality. We support staff to facilitate the physicians be reimbursed for the care that they're provided. So why do so many physicians pick, I don't know, a beginning band concert for no one they know over a coding meeting? Why do they hide from coders? We need to realize that we have distinct skill sets and so do they. Respect theirs and realize what they went to medical school, school for and what they did not get trained and find that balance. How does any of this, whatever you're trying to improve, how does this compliance, this coding, this CMS regulatory, how does any of that matter? to how they're going to take care of this next patient. I, I, I know everyone knows this is how they get paid. But reality is their patients still come first. So when you need to change dictation, you need to change providers documentation pattern, then make sure you can answer one of these four questions. And then you approach the physician in that manner. If we had their chronic medical conditions that impact today's treatment plan, if we had those documented, it would help us with our quality improvement measures. It would help us have the data to identify the target population for our clinical improvement activities. If we knew how many of our patients were um, insulin dependent, Okay, non-compliant insulin dependent. And um, how does this information help define the practice from a marketing perspective? How do we know where our niches are, which type of patients that we treat that maybe no one else does? It's all about data. Diagnosis data is the gold mine in healthcare. It's the foundation of every research study. It is the foundation of every covered, non-covered, experimental, not experimental. Uh, we just need to figure out how to leverage that for our good to get a better patient care record. What do you, you know, well, how, how do I want to say this? Let's just look at this example. Let me tell you, um, how do I, let me just show you this example. That's probably the best thing. Okay, so we all know that CMS does not approve of cloning. We got that. Um, but don't approach your physician that way. 
I don't want to approach the physician and say that CMS is going to target cloning, cloning isn't acceptable, cloning is bad patient care, it, wrong approach. How does cloning impact patient care? How does cutting and pasting a report time over time over time impact the next physician who wants to care for their patient? Well, I can, you know, go through the examples that I have and find one. I can find the one example where it hits home to the risk to a patient. Talk about the quality of the patient care tool. Now we really are talking about taking this task of auditing and moving it from an event into operations and what really matters. On the second or on the 27th of February, a patient presented with the complaints of a breast lump. There was a physical exam. In fact, then the patient was um, sent for a lumpectomy. Unfortunately, look at the physical exam's documentation. Within a month, the patient is scheduled for chemotherapy, but look at the physical exam. Find those examples that hit home to what your audience will listen to. They really don't care what Medicare does or does not want in the record. And they feel that they can defend whatever their records say. That's possible. But that defense takes a lot of time and resources away from patient care. I think you and I have enough information to change the behavior without going down that path. Now, the larger the organization or the larger your process is, it may be more important to really communicate who owns that compliance piece. So if the documentation is insufficient um, you know, in the medical record, is it queried back to the physician? Is it written off? Is it coordinated? The OIG, we all know our friends at the Office of Inspector General, they actually have a compliance program for third-party billing companies. I want to stretch that just a little bit and talk about billing processes. Those of us who are in larger healthcare systems, our billing department might as well be a third-party vendor. We've never met them. We have no real direct contact with them. It's just this mysterical, mystery, um, mystery department. The OIG is writing this for clients, but anyone that's gone through any customer service training knows that we have both internal and external clients. And so we need to think about that. We need to think about how we divide and conquer these responsibilities we call coding and compliance. I respect the provider's skill set and I respect ours. We can't ignore the reality that each and every claim is submitted in their individual NPI and then the collective group tax ID. But physicians can't hide behind that, oh, my billing department does that, or oh, my coders do that. We can't hide behind the physician selected the codes. We really need to use the resources that are available. And if there is this OIG work plan, that, or OIG compliance plan, then we need to look at that. And we, we, being the OIG, recommend that it is coordinated with the providers in establishing compliance responsibilities. The best defense that we really have is a well-written compliance plan. And if I continue to draw on that OIG's perspective, superficial programs that simply pretend to comply, if they don't have appropriate ongoing monitoring, it does not say appropriate quarterly audits, it does not say appropriate quarterly audits with new providers. It says appropriate ongoing monitoring. We need that. Or it could expose the billing department to a greater liability than no program at all. An ineffective compliance program can expose the provider to a liability when they rely on that expertise and they really have no um, input in the game. Now the last bullet on this slide is important and it needs to be well read by leadership. It may require significant additional resources, reallocation of existing resources, to implement an effective compliance program. But the long-term benefits of implementing a program significantly, catch that happy word, significantly outweigh the costs. 
Implementing an effective compliance program requires a substantial commitment of time, energy, and resources by senior management. We can audit till the cows come home, but we've got to have the leadership behind us in the event and when the findings um, highlight changes that need to be made. You know, we cannot purchase a new billing system or a new AMR, and we definitely um, don't have within our scope the opportunity to really put some meat into the physician conversations. So make sure that everyone's on. I know it's a balance. We can't live in the chicken little sky is falling world, and there is a tendency at times to fall into that. This physician never does. Well, when it really might be the three charts in front of me that were annoying me. But we do need to know what's lurking inside that medical record. We need to know what's lurking inside the payer's website. The fact that I didn't know how to report sclerotherapy isn't the best defense. Well, I didn't realize that the system wasn't appending that modifier doesn't really work either. We have a responsibility to evaluate the revenue cycle, but it's an evaluation and not a one-time event. 2016, if you look at this semi-annual report by the OIG, I want you to pay attention to just two primary bullets. The first one, recoveries of more than 2.77 billion in half a year, jump down to the fourth bullet. The civil monetary penalties have increased fivefold in three years. Those statistical findings are not gonna motivate them to stop investigating. If anything, there's going to be a higher number of targeted reviews. And so we need to make sure that we are putting the appropriate resources into process improvement and process monitoring within our organizations. The first time I heard that 250 people could play a role in generating a single patient bill, I was a little skeptical, you know, with that infamous eye roll. And then I watched a client use eight different computer systems to register a patient and then schedule that patient for a heart cath. And I know I'm preaching to the choir. None of those systems talked to each other. So there wasn't this automatic data flow. Each system, I had to repeat the same information. Our jobs are not for the weak or those that require payers to be reasonable. But it does remind us that we need to anticipate that there are problems right here in River City and tackling them one at a time is your compliance plan. An active living, breathing compliance plan is a great defense in the event you miss something. No one is perfect. There are merits for demonstrating efforts and progress. It's a lot easier to say, yeah, I knew about that mistake. We found it last fall. Here's what we've done to fix it. And I just completed a review of the last 30 days and I didn't see it duplicated. In summary, we need to remember that this is a continuous and ongoing effort. We have to stay abreast of this ever changing environment that we basically call our job. This will should be consistent with the job description of your compliance officer, ever assessing the risk, ensuring that there are policies in place to mitigate the risk, document the communication in the train. Okay, let's stop right there for just a minute. Communication, just for the record, does not mean an email to an address the physician doesn't even use. It is not a note in the lunchroom. Communication, like training and education, must be relevant to the audience, appropriate to their work schedule. Do not expect physicians to attend more than a 30-minute, 45-minute coding course. Create podcasts, feedback directly onto their progress notes, write, write on their op notes, and then have a one-on-one -on -one with them. Bring treats if necessary. The auditing and monitoring piece should be so routine that they actually seek you out when they have not heard from you in 90 days. That is the strong sign of an auditing program. It's the last bullet on this slide that really matters. If someone at the front desk is documenting the reason for the visit, then they need to understand what happens to that information next.
If the support staff are prepping orders, then they need to understand why an order cannot be limited to a diagnosis code. It does matter where you document the blood draw or if you document it at all. And everyone involved in that patient care process needs to understand how their role is impacted by coding and compliance. The nature of our personalities in this role might be defined as a little bit of a, a perfectionist or an overachiever. So we've got to be real. We got to recognize that the larger the ship, the slower it's going to turn. We've got to recognize that everybody works within a budget. Everyone has time constraints. There are a variety of learning styles and that this is a full time job to ensure that all the new members are up to speed that all the existing members have updates and changes, and that all the training material is live. It is a full-time adventure. You need to recognize what you can and cannot manage internally when you politically need that outside opinion. That neutral party can be beneficial in watching changes in guidelines and the requirements for procedures that you do, but maybe you don't do them every day. I respect the position you're in been there in a lot of respects i'm still there but i hope that there was something in this session that at least offered a starting point a new way to look at maybe even just one piece of your auditing piece one way to take the raw numbers and make them mean something more in the trenches coding strategies appreciates the trust you place in us as a partner in this coding and compliance journey don't hesitate to reach out if you need further information on any of the topics that were highlighted today. Thank you, and have a great day. Thank you so much, Karna, and thank you so much, attendees. Um, we're just about out of time, so if uh, you have any questions, attendees, please send those to us, and we will forward them on to Karna. So um, you can send those to us um, at firsthcc.com. Uh, you can also call us at 888-543-4778. Uh, you can also request future webinars. Um, you can register for those at our website. You can also request a demo of our compliance solution um, on our website. And thank you so much for joining us. And thank you again, Karna. Uh, so thank you again, attendees. Have a great day.